Hi there, and welcome to the Author's Cut, hosted by Book Club Babel. I am your host from Book Club Babel, Tabitha Lord, and I'm here tonight with Karen McManus. I'm so excited that she's going to be speaking to us about her debut novel, One of Us is Lying. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, if you have logged on with us on Zoom, um, you can see us and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. However, if you'd like to get a question to Karen, just take your mouse and hover over the bottom of the screen and there's a little chat icon. If you click that, you can send a question and I will make sure that she gets it and I will see it in the side of my screen here as a rolling commentary. All right, so Karen, welcome Hi. to Book Club Babel. Thanks so much for having me. It's great it's a, to be here. Such a pleasure to have you and I'm so excited that you have released your debut novel, One of Us is Lying. Yes. And it is a YA, I would call it a suspenseful, a suspenseful coming of age kind of a story. So do you want to tell us just a little bit about it first before sure. we uh, dive into some questions? Yeah. So, you know, the way I sort of initially conceived of it and, and pitched it from the beginning was the breakfast club with murder. So the notion is there are five students who go into detention, exactly a similar setup, very stereotypical types, um, a brain, a jock, a princess, a um, athlete and uh, an outcast. But what happens is that one of them does not leave that room alive. And the person who dies was the creator of a notorious gossip app at the school. And he had secrets on all the other four that he was about to spill. So when investigators learn that his death wasn't an accident, they begin to suspect those four. And their secrets come out. They have to deal with the fallout from that while also navigating this investigation, not really trusting each other and uh, having even more secrets come out over time. So uh, it is sort of a suspense mystery, but it's also very much a character study mm -hmm. on you know, what happens to people in that type of pressurized situation and how do they, you know, what happens when your deepest secrets come out and how do you face those? Yeah, and, and it was really wonderful. You did it in um, all four voices, the four, the four main characters and yeah. switched um, in between the voices and each one was really distinct. And I had asked you in the written interview we did earlier, who was your favorite to write? And you said Nate. Yes. Can you just talk a little bit about Nate's character and why he was so easy for you to write, why he was your favorite? Yeah, I love writing Nate. Nate is the, the criminal, you know, he's the bad mm -hmm. boy. He has right. the sad story and the difficult home life. And you know, he's the one at the beginning who would be the most obvious suspect um, because he's the only one of them who's ever been in trouble and in fact has a criminal record. Um, but, you know, deep down, Nate has uh, a lot more to him than that. Um, he also has a very sort of sarcastic, um, cynical tone to his voice um, and, and a good sense of humor. So he was just a lot of fun to write. He was one of those characters that just sort of sprang to life very quickly. And I would sit down and I would start to write him. And it was almost like he took over and I didn't really have to do anything. He would just sort of drive the you know, the car and then I'd follow along for the ride and an hour later I'd have a scene and it didn't need that much editing. Um, so that was really fun. Not every character was like that, um, but, but he was just, uh, had a very clear voice from the beginning to me. Yeah, and I really liked him as well. I thought he was just, he was, you know, he wasn't, he, in a way it was sort of predictable that he wasn't going to be as bad as he right. was, but I, I liked the depth that you gave him and I liked that, that it, didn't, it didn't really come easy, his softening up and, and his opening up. It was, it, you know, you had to work for that. Yeah, but he, was, he was a great character. The other one that I, I, I loved all the characters, but I thought Addie, and she was one that you probably, you know, as a reader, maybe didn't like her so much at first because she was the one who cared very much about, she had more identified herself by what other people thought about her and was yeah. very, you know, into the sort of the beauty queen kind of thing and her boyfriend. And, uh, and yet she was the one to me who had the most growth um, as a, as a person and the most like sort of eye opening. She almost, I want to say she didn't lose the most because I, that's not really true, but it, for her, you know, um, her, her breaking out of her, her stereotype and her shell and kind of, finding her own voice was super important and powerful of a, you know, a character arc. Um, so 
what, what did you, you know, how did you conceive of her? Did she, in your mind, did you start out with thinking, yes, this one is going to be the one that really does that? Or did she? I didn't. She, she surprised she me. You. <laughs> she surprised me. Um, you know, in the beginning, I don't think most people do like her. You're not supposed right. to like her. You know, she's the shallow one. Right. She really is. Um, you know, she's sort of obsessed with her boyfriend. She cares a lot about her status. Um, you know, she thinks about her looks all the time. Um, but there is more there. And, you know, she was one where I, I, at the very beginning, there were like these little hints that maybe there was more to her, you know, that she had these flashes of consciousness. Um, and then as things sort of happened around her and she reacted to them, um, you know, she did lose a lot or she felt like she lost a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but that sort of pulling away of all the things that had defined her gave her this voice that I didn't fully expect, um, that came out of her. And then her whole arc just kind of, again, took off a little bit in a different direction than I expected, um, where yeah. she ended up at the end wasn't necessarily where I thought she would be at the beginning but about halfway through I felt like I really knew this character and where she was going and it and it all seemed like it made sense she was she was great and I loved her relationship with her sister and I, I said in the um you know in our written interview that sort of that they had like a it was like a gently feminist theme that the, the sisters sort of found their own voices together um and I thought you did a really good job with some of these minor I won't call them minor but you know sort of second tier characters, um, and the sister, the reporter that ended up being, you know, really, he really had a, a, an important voice and a message. And yeah. so, um, you know, when you were developing these other characters, does, does anybody stand out to you as a favorite or somebody that took on more importance than you thought they might, or, um, you know, just had, had more of a, I don't know, more, more impact than you yeah. intended or who's your favorite I, of them? <laughs> I did. I love the sisters too. Yeah. Um, I especially love Maeve who is Bronwyn's sister, but I also loved Ashton who's Addie's mm -hmm. sister. I have a sister who is my best friend. And so, so much of what, when I write siblings, mm -hmm. um, I often base them off my relationship with my sister. So yeah. having these sisters who are great friends just felt like a very natural way to structure the family relationships um and and but there were different types of sisters you know right. one they started off a little bit distant the other they were really close and they kind of stayed that way um but with both those sisters i kind of wanted to give them their own little mini arcs you know like even though they weren't main characters they had growth that they needed to go through as well that they were kind of doing in parallel to what their siblings were going through on this sort of national stage with all these eyes on them right. so that was something that i tried to do with um all the primary second characters was give them something beyond just the plot so that they felt like real people too yeah it gave it a lot of depth you know and just some just a little bit more of an interesting side plot. And you did care. You cared about what happened to these yeah. side characters, not as much, but but a good bit. You know, I was like, oh, I hope that they get to, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, my little hopes. <laughs> I, I saw this, um, someone tagged me in a great review the other day, and he had one line in it that said, I would lay my life down for Maeve. <laughs> I love right? that. Maeve was a great character. She had this like quiet strength. You didn't sort of see that strength coming, you know, of that, that bulldog sister, you know, she was going to have her sister's back, you know, yeah. and in sort of this interesting way. And I really like that. Yeah. That, I mean, so the character that you don't really like is of course, Simon. And we see Simon through yeah. everyone else's eyes. And, um, you know, he really is a, he's the villainous villain of the story in a way. Um, but yet you did give him some sympathy. And especially when you got to hear, um, about his friendship with Janai, and you know what her perception was and the things she knew about him that no one else knew and how he you know sort of became this cynical and you know um angry boy um so how was how was that where did where did the seed for simon come from and how did he develop in your mind yes yeah, simon is tricky you know because obviously mm -hmm. he's only on the page right. for um a few pages um and and then he's someone that people remember um, or talk about. So trying to give him, um, uh, trying to, to flesh him out was a challenge. And I think, you know, with a, a lot of um, his, his backstory was, you know, feeling entitled to something mm -hmm. that he didn't have and, uh, mm -hmm. and acting out by creating this app that kind of allowed him to be powerful in a way that he wasn't in the rest of his life. Right. That's a, it's a tricky one because, you know, you have to make him have some sympathy. Right. You have to have some sympathy for him because he's still a child in a, in a yeah. way, you know, and that, but yeah, he was a good, he was a, he was a good one. Um, okay. So you wrote a YA book. So why did you pick that um, age group to, 
to tell a story to? So, you know, when I started writing again, I was inspired after reading The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. Um, I just, I love that series. And in particular, I think, I didn't know what to call it at the time, but the young adult voice really appealed to me. I just felt like it moved the story along beautifully and, uh, you know, I couldn't finish it fast enough. And so I started reading in the age genre, in the Mm -hmm. category, and I felt like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, I think this is something I could try and, and I think I could, you know, pull it off. Um, the first book I wrote, of course, sounded like Suzanne Collins because you tend to <laughs> copy your, your dystopian idol. thriller. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't it's my kind of voice at all. Um, right, right. That came over time. Yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, so how many books did you put in your drawer before you dusted this one off and sent it to the so this is my third that I finished, but I was like my, my terrible dystopian book, which I did write my first book also had like sequels to it that I sort of worked on off and on. So, um, yeah, I, I had quite a few that I tried <laughs> before well, I got you hit, you hit just the right notes with this one. So I don't, I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, and, you know, and just to talk a little bit more about that YA voice, I, I, I read a lot of YA too. I loved Susan, Susan Collins. I'm just yeah. that. I thought this was brilliant. You know, it really just, yeah, it had, it had layers of depth. And I think um, with YA, you have to have enough depth and enough um, darkness really, because that age group is, that is that changing time period. And you know, you're the, the, the angsty teenagers or just, yeah. you know, and they're, they're just, they're grappling with things. Um, but at the same time, you can't tip it over into real adult you know, darkness. And so how did you, you know, and, and you took a theme that really, you know, could, did go a little bit dark and yeah. yet you kept it where I would let my 13, 14 year old read it. So talk a little bit about trying to strike that right balance in this, in this genre and this age group, actually not a genre, but this age group. Yeah. I mean, it's a tricky balance for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I do think that the young adult reader of today is um, pretty sophisticated. You know, mm-hmm. kids um, are saturated with a lot of media. You know, they see a lot, they hear a lot. Um, you know, I think parents are, many parents are, are very open with their kids. And um, so they, there is a expectation, you know, that, that uh, you're, you're dealing with the real world issues that they see around them. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, you're not writing an adult thriller. And um, for me, I I didn't want anything on the page that would be um, really alarming uh, in that respect. You know, I I tried to keep a lot of what happened that that was um, disturbing was something that, you know, people might hear about or something that someone else had experienced, but it wasn't necessarily described on the page. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of how I balanced it. The other thing was that, you know, even though something very shocking happens at the beginning to someone that these kids all know, this was not someone that they were close to. And so Mm -hmm. while it was traumatizing and it was frightening, it wasn't something where they were were deeply grieving a loss of somebody that they were very close to. And so in that respect, there was able to be some humor um, Mm -hmm. and some lightness to the tone that wouldn't be appropriate if you were dealing with, you know, a deeply personal loss. Right, right. Excellent. And so you took some topics like social media and that app that Simon developed and, and privacy issues and all the things that come along with our, this, this online presence that we have, that our kids have, that, um, and you added in some school violence-y kind of things or, you know, that, that uh, and some cyberbullying, all things that are really hot topics. So when you had the seed for the story, what was the, like the driving force? Was it this idea that you wanted to explore um, you know, these, these things that our kids are dealing with and, and kind of put it on the stage, you know, in, in, the, in the, for, the forefront? Or was it, did you, did you just have the breakfast club idea of the kids are going to detention and, you know, they'll come out and something's happened? Like, you talk a little yeah. bit about that? That was, you know, that was the original germ was just, you know, something happens and they're in the room, but it really didn't take off because I, you know, for a while I couldn't think, well, why would you ever be in that scenario? That, that's, hard to picture. Um, And when I got the idea for the gossip app, then it really started to take off because I felt like that did sort of, you know, speak to a lot of really current issues. Um, Just the fact that once something about you is sort of out there, it's really hard to take back now. You know, it's a, it's something that maybe will follow you around for a very long time. And so even though to um, an adult, some of these secrets that are being kept might not seem like something that would motivate you to take such a 
drastic step when you're 16, 17 years old and you know that your entire online life is going to implode. That is kind of terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. It's something we couldn't have imagined when we were kids. You know, if you took a stupid picture, you could get all the copies, you know, right, you, right. you destroy it and no one ever and, has to see it. <laughs> and now it lives, you know, and, and it lives in it. And it's just, it's an interesting thing that these kids have, uh, you know, these kids, I feel like an old lady, but you know, <laughs> kids today, but really it is a, it is a generational thing. That's something that we won't ever really understand. I don't think that no. their comfort level with having this much of themselves exposed or this ease of, um, you know, just posting this or that online. And, you know, I just don't have that comfort with it. Right. And I'm sure most people that are just one generation up don't. And yet they do. And yet there is a difference between privacy, you know, uh, secrets, secret keeping and appropriate privacy. And you hit on that in the book and without any spoilers, you know, can you just talk a little bit about how you explored that piece yeah. of, of the story? So there were, you know, some characters who had unequivocally done something wrong. You know, right. they, they had cheated in some way. They had broken a rule. They had, you know, violated trust. They, they did a thing that they should not have done. And even though, you know, you can argue that this was a really extreme punishment for that, that was sort of information that needed to get out there to the injured parties. Um, very different. There was another character um, who had a personal private issue that was exposed, not hurting somebody else. It was a secret he wasn't ready to share. And, uh, and that came out in the course of the investigation. So I did want to kind of draw a line between, between those things. Um, mm -hmm. And, and and kind of show that, well, when you have um, something that you, you know you shouldn't have done, it's, it's a horrible experience, um, but there's maybe some relief in having mm -hmm. the information out there because you probably felt guilty about it and you probably right. wanted to, to, to make amends in some way. You just mm -hmm. didn't know how. Um, but it's a very different situation when your privacy has been violated. Um, and, and that's going a little bit too far, especially when you're, you're dealing with teenagers. Right who may not be ready to talk about whatever it is that they don't want to talk about yet. Yeah. Um, so I thought that the breakfast club part of it was one of the, one of my favorite things about the breakfast club was the relationship between the kids that built over time in that little, that yeah. setting that they were in and how they were able to see beyond their stereotypes. And that was obviously the theme of the breakfast club is, you know, there's more to us than meets the eye. And we all have these backstories that are, you know, powerful and we carry them with us and they define us, but they don't define us entirely. And you did that, with these these characters that was one of the really neat things to watch evolve is their relationship to with each other and of course you added in this element of a murder mystery so yeah. they couldn't immediately start to trust one another they almost had to have a bit of a suspicion about one another or just a wariness because they they started to want to protect themselves but they quickly you know, went from self-protection, which I think the adults were trying to get them to do, to this bonding together and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, I can see you and I want, you know, like we, we're here to get, we're in this together. And um, that was a really cool thing to see happen. And I have to say it was one of my favorite things about the book. And I'm sure you were trying to say there's more to people than meets the eye, but what do you, what do you really want to say to your, you know, your teen audience with that piece? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely a part of it. And I think, um, you know, I personally love stories where unlikely people come together and find out that they have more in common than they thought that they did. Right. And so that was something that I wanted to do. And, you know, with each character, they definitely had a role that they were comfortable with, you know, either they had taken it on or it had been given to them, but either way they accepted it. And that was sort of like who they were, you know, and as, as time went by and they reacted to the chaos around them, these other layers came out. Um, and I think one of the things that I did want to show, not only, you know, you, you can't judge a book by its cover, which is, is true and, and probably obvious throughout the story, but also just um, acceptance, you mm -hmm. know, of yourself in this like imperfection that we all have and of other people, you know, and, and their imperfections and figuring out ways to make connections even when you don't fully understand somebody else. Yes, it's, it's such an important uh, message, I think, especially in today's, you know, we're in such a polarized culture right now, you know, with this. Uh, and I just saw something online about, um, you know, it's really contempt when we have contempt for yeah. one another. Yeah. That, you know, you really can't work past that in, in a way. You have to find a way to, 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 to lose the contempt and have the dialogue again and see past, you know, just 
you know, have a real debate. It's really important to have a debate. No, we don't all want to be the same person, but the contempt piece. And I thought these kids did a really, they, they did a model job of, <laughs> of learning that lesson. Eventually, and, and yeah. Really, they did have some contempt in the beginning. They did. They did, but they worked through it and, and passed it and really, and it became real for them. What they have with each other was real at the end. Yeah. And, you know, that was, that was special. They'll take that lesson. These fictional people will take that lesson with them, but your readers, your teen readers will take that hopefully to heart, which is, I'm sure, something you hoped, hope will happen. Yeah, I hope so. So crafting suspense. Let's talk a little writing craft for a little bit. Um, so, you know, what are some of the techniques you used to, um, to build the suspense and to keep the plot moving along? Because it did move. And I, yeah. I read the book in one sitting. I'll tell you that, which was really, neck pace. <laughs> it was like real, like I just didn't want to put it, I was on an airplane anyway. So I was like, perfect. I could finish the whole thing uninterrupted. And, you know, it was a long cross country flight. So I read the whole thing and I was just like, yeah. whew. That was a great read. I really had that satisfaction, you know, coming through it and, and getting to the end. So okay. how did you build the suspense? What techniques as a writer can you share with us? Yeah, so, you know, that was one of the benefits of having four main characters. I mean, there's right. lots of challenges with having four main characters, mm -hmm. but when you have an ensemble cast, you can, you know, get close to a reveal. You can take a character almost like right to that edge when they're about to say something that um, will advance the mystery or will put a piece of the puzzle in place. And then you switch, you know, and you go to somebody else. And you don't have to finish that thought, um, somebody else picks up a different piece. So I did that a lot. You know, a character mm -hmm. would get to a point where they almost revealed something and then we just do a perspective switch. Um, so that was one and that was mm -hmm. fun to use. Um, I also tried to do a lot of sort of mini cliffhangers at mm -hmm. the end of each, uh, not each chapter, but at the end of chapters. So, you know, um, all the characters had secrets. Those came out, you know, not that far into the book, um, but those were the secrets that Simon knew about. You know, they all had other smaller secrets, more personal secrets that they were carrying around. And those were things that got unve unveiled more slowly. Um, and so little hints about those at the end of uh, a chapter would kind of keep you thinking, oh, you know, I was going to put this book down and go to bed, but now I have to see what happens. Now I have to keep reading. So, <laughs> so that was the hope anyway, that that would, uh, that technique would work. That totally worked. So <laughs> it totally worked. So how does it feel to hold the book in your hand? Oh, it feels so great. I love the cover. Yeah, it was good. That was what I was going to ask you about. So the cover art, I'm just going to hold it up so people can see yeah. the cover. It's on, the, oh, it's on our website anyway. So we have the cover of the book in the post um, on the website. But um, who designed, do you know who designed the cover? And, or how, did you get any input into it? Or did you just see it? I did have input, um, but the, the comp they showed me was almost exactly that. And I loved it right away. Yeah. And I had no preconceived notion. I didn't, I'm not that visual of a person. Yeah. I didn't really know what the cover should be. I just knew I didn't want four faces on it, like actual right. people. Because, yeah. you know, I have a picture in my mind of what they look like. And I knew nobody was ever going to look right. that way. Of course. And like and every reader was going to have a yeah, different picture. You I don't want readers to have their own pictures right. as well. So that I knew I didn't want that. But I also thought, you know, there, obviously there's four of them. Somehow, mm -hmm. you know, conveying that would be great. But I don't know how you do it. And I just thought it was really inspired how they it pulled really that together. Is. And I like the, you know, I love the red font. I think it looks like a Sharpie scrawled across someone's locker, which is perfect for all the gossip that happens. Yep. I like how they're sort of connected, but they're also separate, that they mm -hmm. put the masks on. Like there was, I thought, felt like there was a lot going on thematically, even beyond the fact that it looked striking. It's a very stunning cover, but it does. It has a lot of, you know, like sort of subtext in there, yeah. which is great. Yeah, it really yeah. works. And so this is the hard, hardback edition. I will show it one more time. Yeah. Fabulous. And so you had a release party. It, the book released yeah. yesterday, correct? That was your release date. It did. Yep. May 30th. So exciting. And so you had a party. And I always am interested in this. Which passage did you read from the book? Uh, so, you know, it was interesting. It was actually sort of a little hard to pick because yeah. my, my son is 10. Right. Um, a lot of 10 year olds were going to be there. Right. Um, this is not a book for 10 year olds. So I didn't, you know, certainly want to read anything that was age inappropriate. So I looked right. at chapter one. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> chapter two, <laughs> no. And mm -hmm. then I finally got to chapter three. And it, that was actually a great chapter to read, too, because it's at a point where, um, you know, the traumatic event has occurred, but the students are not 
suspicious are not suspects yet. So mm -hmm. they're being called together in the principal's office just to be questioned like anybody would, um, right. but by a police officer this time as opposed to by one of their teachers. Mm -hmm. And the questions that he asks makes them all in turn, you know, sort of very uncomfortable. And the narrating student, which is Cooper in this case, Cooper's the jock, Cooper's looking around and seeing these reactions among the other three mm -hmm. that makes him sort of, you know, question them and how they felt about Simon. So it's planting these seeds of suspicion in, in Cooper, but also in the reader that, you know, something is not uh, what we thought it was, maybe. Yeah, it's always tricky to pick which, which thing to read. <laughs> yeah. You know, the first chapter is always usually the grabby chapter, but sometimes you have something that you're more attached to or has more meaning for you as the writer that you want, you know, that you can tell a little, you know, this is why I picked this part. But yeah, I was just curious which one you had chosen. And so, you know, your journey to becoming a published author. So you, you are not, you were not a writer. You have a different profession by day. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. And I know you have a journalism degree as well as your English degree and you've never a journalist. So never. talk a little bit about <laughs> your professional life and, and how it led up to becoming the published author. Yeah, well, you know, really my, my professional life is, is still pretty separate, although I've always written, um, you know, professionally business type writing. So I've always liked words. But I worked for years in public relations. Um, journalism was actually a degree I got um, when I was thinking about making a career change from PR to journalism. Never actually made that. <laughs> switched over to marketing instead, um, and marketing is still what I do during the day. So I had and have had, you know, a fairly lengthy career doing that. Um, and writing was something I didn't even really do as a hobby. Um, and it's it's something I did as a as a child and a young adult. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just sort of dropped it, and you know, yep. did a career and had a child and all that sort of stuff. But a couple of years ago, I, I decided to pick it up again and just give it a try. And it was so fun and such a great creative outlet that even though that first effort, you know, wasn't great, um, it was it was so much fun. I wanted to keep trying. And I'd also at that point started meeting a community of writers. Mm -hmm. Um, and exchanging work with them. And that is something that really helps your own writing improve. So I could see that I could get better this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it is the community of writers is super helpful and inspiring and, and supportive, which is really nice thing to have around you when you're cutting your teeth on. <laughs> this, <Definitely. laughs> you know? And so you, um, you pitched this manuscript, mm -hmm. got an agent, how long from start to finish would you say it took you? I think it's always interesting for the general population to understand that it's a, it's a process, you know, it takes a bit. <laughs> this was actually, this pretty book quick. Was, Yours was, was pretty not quick. normal. Yeah, this book, um, I wrote it in about two months. I revised it in about two months. Um, my agent was one of the first agents I queried and she right. responded really fast and she offered really fast. And then we didn't have that much revision to do. Um, so we went out on submission pretty fast and, yeah. and I got an offer there pretty fast. So the whole process was probably about six months. That's fantastic. And that, well, that's pretty unusual. Book. And it's a great voice and it, this is a super hot, you know, topic. So I can see why it would be scooped right up because it's so relevant to, you know, modern coming of age, you know, it really is. So, so what else have you got in the works? So I do have a second book um, with Delacorte, which is yep. my imprint um, with my editor that I'm working on now. So that is also going to be a, something in the suspense thriller vein, young adult, and it's slated to publish in 2018. That's exciting. So, yeah. So that'll Does be my have follow. a title or a working title. I know. It's, it they never keep it. their titles anyway. You know, no. the one you have on the top of the, you know, you type on the top of the page is not ever what ends up being, the at least from my experience, it's like, that was a dumb title. I need a better title. <laughs> well, one of us is lying was actually my title, but it wasn't the title for the longest time. It was, um, I was just calling it Breakfast Club Murder for a really long time because I couldn't think of a title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spaceship book. That's what I, you know, I call my Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. It's just like shorthand for your book and you know, eventually at some point you'll have to replace it, but you got to call it something. Uh, yes, yes, you do. Well, it was a fantastic debut. I'm so thrilled for you. Thank you. And um, I thank you for joining us tonight. And just for our viewers, um, they're, they're, this interview will be posted on the Book Club Babble website. It will be posted on YouTube. And so we can view it and you can take the link and share it with your newfound fans. Is this oh, what, that sounds I good. really highly, highly recommend the book to anybody, uh, adults and uh, people that have teenagers. It's a fantastic read. Super quick read in terms of not quick, like it's a short book, but you can't put it down. 
So. I've heard three hours is <laughs> plane ride. <laughs> Maybe the average, right? If you're an airplane commuter. ride, basically, and it was you just can tear through it. You can you can, you want to tear through it because yeah. you want to know you did the perfect job of keeping those uh, chapters at the end, wanting to you know ma making the reader want to turn the page. So Excellent. we all in my family, everyone else will look forward to reading it in my house. So. Thank you very much for joining yes. us this evening. Thanks so much and for having me. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Pleasure. Have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay. Stop. Video. All right. I stopped the video. There we go. Okay, kids. All right. Well, thank I you think, so much. That I was I think fun. we're off. So it, usually it, it disconnects unexpectedly. So... <laughs> I'm gonna stop it now. And sorry if it's an abrupt, um, if it's an abrupt goodbye. I'll send you a text message. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.